Now, with views you can trust and opinions you cannot ignore, the State of the Nation, next on Avaderna 24. The following program on Avaderna 24 is classified MA. It is intended for adults and may be unsuitable for children under 17. It may contain crude and decent language, explicit sexual activity, graphic violence, or political ideology. Viewer discretion is strictly advised. State of the Nation is an opinion-based program. The thoughts and opinions shared within this program are not intended to offend or disregard anyone's perspectives or beliefs. We aim to foster open dialogue, encourage critical thinking, and explore thought-provoking subjects. Recognizing the importance of diversity and inclusion, this program welcomes all viewpoints and cherishes the right to express them freely. This program also contains the opinions of the participants and does not reflect the views and beliefs of the Verna Media Network. The network believes in a safe space for all ideas to be expressed and on its duty to create such a platform for free speech. Viewer discretion is strictly advised. The United States of Sri Lanka. As the island nation pushes itself towards new heights, events occurring, be it in the economy or politics, it doesn't feel like a new path. Solutions sorted out by our leaders seems to be the same old, same old. We act as if the path put forward by the IMF is the word of God. While all opportunities worldwide that would help Sri Lanka propel to a regional leader have been missed and sometimes omitted. And then there's the story of our nation's health. For insights and analysis on this returning episode, tonight, I'll speak to medical practitioner and professor at Australians for Science and Freedom, Professor David Richards, Associate Professor of Homeland Security at Rubdan University, UAE, Dr. John Harrison, former governor of the Central Bank, Ajit Nivad Kabra, political economist, Niyam Tiri Kadiragama, Minister of Health, Kehelia Rambukwella, SJB Parliamentarian Iran Vikramaratna, SLFB Parliamentarian Tilanga Sumatipala, Leader of the Pivituru Hela Urumea Parliamentarian Uday Gamantila, and All Ceylon Tamil Congress Parliamentarian Gajendra Kumar Ponambalam. Good evening, I'm Mahish Joni, and this is the State of the Nation. A very good evening everyone, welcome to the State of the Nation where we dive deep into the issues that matter most to you. Now in this fast-paced world of mainstream media, finding diverse opinions and alternative perspectives can sometimes be challenging. And that's why we're here to provide you with a platform where different viewpoints coexist and where we challenge the status quo. Buckle up, because today we're bringing you a fresh take on current affairs you won't find anywhere else. Recently, I was thinking about this simple question. How come 6.9 million Sri Lankans got it wrong? Surely all of them cannot be idiots, even though that's exactly what the Colombo liberal idiot class would say. So what happened? How come 6.9 million Sri Lankans got it wrong? Now, prior to the election, we knew the whole character of former Defence Secretary Gotabe Rajpaksa. He was a ruthless, strict, disciplined, hard-working individual not only the one who designed the final phase of the war, which is kind of questionable right now, not just the war, he even led the way in uplifting the image of our capital city, Colombo. He made the city of Colombo shine like a beacon of prosperity, class and quality. So when he was elected as the presidential candidate, it was a no-brainer. At that time, after the colossal failure of the Yahapalni joke, Sri Lankans were longing for discipline, structure, lawfulness, and more importantly, a direction towards growth. And Gotabe Rajapaksa was indeed set to succeed. After he became the president and after his honeymoon, honeymoon period was uh, over, all of us were left wondering, who the hell is this guy? This ain't the strong-headed, disciplined, hardline defense secretary we all were longing for as our president. Is this a very bad clone of him? Now, as Sri Lankans, this is where we need to ask the tough questions. 
What really happened? How come a strong-minded leader was forced to kneel and was completely neutralized and made a feeble person who could not execute simple instructions as the head of state when the entire country was collapsing apart? Let's not go all around the world to figure this out. Let's ask ourselves. If we are strong individuals, at what point will we bow down in defeat? In most instances, uh, it occurs in the instant that our enemy has some information that's detrimental to us. If they knew uh, a bit of information that would completely tarnish our image and destroy our lives, we would think twice before doing anything against that person. So what did they have on our former president that made Gotabe Rajapaksa the lion to become Gotabe Rajapaksa the lion carcass? We're told by individuals close to him that the reason he was like that uh, was because he didn't want to uh, want the United States or the collective West to bring more accusations against him on human rights. And if that happens, he will not be able to go to the United States or to the West after his presidency. But that doesn't make sense because even at the time he took oaths as the head of state of Sri Lanka, there were many allegations and accusations leveled at him by the UNHRC that were basically the same thing. He denied them all and was not even bothered about it. He was never afraid of that in the past. But now you are telling me that he, all of a sudden, he let the country go to waste a presidency to the dogs because of a simple threat of human rights as at the cesspool of bias, the UNHRC. It doesn't add up. It doesn't, does it? Then we have to obviously ask the other question. Did America have something that would end him and was, was that what individuals like Victoria Nuland, who came to Sri Lanka twice, alerted it, him to? Now, if that's the case, then what is this information that's so detrimental as Sri Lankans we have the right to know? If it was so detrimental, didn't our intelligence officials wet him before he took office? I'm sure a threat assessment would have taken place to determine that. After all, this is the highest office of our land. There's only one individual who can answer all this. And he chose to flee the country in the dead of night like a common criminal and up to date has failed to address the very souls who trusted him with their lives. We must ask these questions and find the truth to avoid repeating the same extremely costly mistakes. We'll be right back. Welcome back everyone to the State of the Nation. In our lead story tonight, is Sri Lanka's health in crisis? Now I'm not talking about the economy, even though uh, that health too is in shambles, but I'm talking about the crisis looming in the health sector. A no confidence motion against the Minister of Health, Kehili Ramukalla, will be presented to the parliament this week. And here the opposition hopes to make a statement regarding the health sector's issues. However, there's a conversation about uh, another no confidence uh, motion brought in by the Samajjana Balavegya concerning the Minister of Public Security, Tiran Alas, because according to the opposition, he has failed to create a safe and secure environment. But tonight's our focus is on health, not just the administrative part, but more so the issues that have arisen since of late. Now, one of the biggest accusations against the Minister of Health is that he has failed to secure a, a process to import quality and safe medication into the country. Several fatalities were reported, as you know, across the nation um, due, to the, due to using uh, substandard drugs. But the other question at hand is when the economy needs stability within the country, is it ethical to bring in such a no-confidence motion against the government? Or well, we pose that question to the main opposition, the Samagi Janabalaveke. Watch. A no confidence motion is being brought because there is an unprecedented health crisis in the country. Uh, there is a 
lack of drugs, no drugs. People go into the hospitals and they come out with no medicines, pharmaceuticals. They are going in search of these pharmaceuticals. Then also there is accusation that the quality of drugs are of low quality. And uh, this low quality has also been a big issue. There has been an Indian line of credit and under the Indian line of credit companies have been bringing in drugs and uh, the quality of those drugs have been in question. And in fact, uh, the Supreme Court granted leave in April 2023 uh, for, to proceed with a case on quality, safety and efficacy of drugs. We have to fix the system. The minister needs to understand the NMRA Act, if there are shortcomings, needs to be fixed. The medical ordinance needs to be fixed, not done away with, so that decisions are going to be made by politicians, ministers and cabinet. These decisions have to be made with specialists in the field. So, we need to fix the system, not just be just critical and try to take things to our hands and think that we can do it. Politicians need to know their limitations, their speciality. We are there on policy and on making legislation. That is what we should be doing. So, let us strengthen the system. If this minister does not understand it, obviously he has to go. Somebody asked me what will happen in the no confidence motion. Will you all win the no confidence motion? Well, it is not a question of winning we will take a vote by name, so that the people in this country will know how their representatives have voted on this no confidence motion. Well, within this week, the no confidence uh, motion is expected to hit the parliament and debates will take place on the matter. I am sure we as a nation will learn more about the issues about the administrative part of the health sector, which would be a vital part indeed. Now, as you know, all this is a numbers game. So, the government seems confident that they have the numbers. In fact, the president himself made it compulsory for all parliamentarians to be present in parliament this week just to make sure that the government can collectively defeat the no confidence motion. So, can the opposition break the government's strong wall of numbers? This is what some of the opposition, opposition members had to say. Watch. On the one hand, almost every trade union in the health sector is almost every day on the road uh, with protests, strikes, uh, work to rule, what not. On the other hand, medical professionals, professionals are leaving the country at a rapid rate, which is known as brain drain. As a result, uh, there will be irreversible damage because we need some time to replace the medical officers or consultants because it is it, it takes a long time to produce a medical professional intolerable corruption corruption at every level and every every aspect of the health sector to demonstrate our disappointment frustration and disgust we will support the no confidence motion against the health minister see the plight we are in now. The general public has to consume all these medication which are not up to the standard. So, semi-standard, substandard medicine has come into the market. It is available. People are utilizing. They cannot afford it. On top of that, we are saying only one individual is responsible. I think the ministry is not having their reputation. The Ministry of Health has no confidence in the public. They think they are just passing the buck from one to the other. Nobody is coming out and really taking the responsibility. Neither people can, can understand and pick where the problem is. Therefore, there should be a select committee in parliament, go into the matter properly, come out with the proper documentation or a report, then deal with the people who are corrupt and who are responsible. So, I think this vote of non confidence, the vote of no confidence should be, first of all, against the government of Sri Lanka right now in power. The Tamil National People's Front has uh, uh, agreed to be a signatory to the no confidence motion against the uh, Health Minister Honorable Kehle Ramukwella. Uh, of course, this is not a matter uh, that is targeting him personally, uh, but with regards to the way in which the health sector has been handled uh, in general by the uh, by the government. Uh, already, as far as the northeast is concerned, uh, there have been. Uh, complaints that we have been making in Parliament uh, and outside with regards to severe shortage uh, of essentials, uh, medicine, uh, substandard medicine. Uh, uh, when it comes to cancer patients, there is a cancer hospital in uh, in Telipade where uh, there is no dye 
uh, to have contrast uh, scannings in, uh, in the Jaffna hospital. So these have been uh, repeated um, complaints that we have been making uh, and unfortunately no, uh, no positive response has, uh, has been reached. We will be f voting in favour uh, of the no confidence motion uh, against the minister. Well, despite all this, the current Minister of Health, Kehelia Rambukwella, was defiant and confident that he would prevail in the exercise of no confidence. Here's the minister speaking to us earlier. Well, there's no doubt at all as far as the no confidence is concerned. Uh, well, whether the government has, it is not an uh, issue of numbers. The complaint or the issues that are raised through the uh, you know, confidence motion, the motion have no relevance whatsoever. It makes, in fact, uh, those complaints or the, the issues that are raised in the you know, confidence motion itself uh, are baseless. So uh, it is not a question of the government is in the majority and therefore that uh, we can go through it. It's beyond that because factually incorrect. I mean, after all, like I said before, it's a numbers game and the government seems to be very confident. However, despite all this, there are real issues that need answers. Now, if getting rid of the Minister of Health is helping to solve those issues, then of course everyone will agree that, that it would be the best way forward. But if this is done to gain political mileage, well, that's precisely what I said earlier. We really haven't learned our lesson. Let's take a short break. Upon our return, we will talk to you more about health, specifically the cardiac health of young adults. What's going on? Stick around. This is the State of the Nation. Back in a moment. Everyone to the state of the nation. Now there is evidence shown around the world that more young adults are experiencing heart problems compared to decades past, and that worsening lifestyle habits, namely poor diet and lack of exercise, are to be blamed. Some researchers uh, even suggest that COVID-19 infections and possibly the vaccines are adding insult to injury. Now, many doctors around the world are sounding the alarm on this factor because uh, they consider this where young people uh, have cardiac issues, a global health emergency. So in the age category of uh, 20 to 50, there's a tremendous increase in heart issues which catapulted in the last few years. This is uh, one of the reasons that many believe COVID-19 would have played a role in this fact. Now, one thing uh, that highlighted this issue is when uh, in late July, if you remember, 18-year-old uh, uh, Bronny James, uh, the oldest son of uh, NBA star LeBron James, collapsed after going into cardiac arrest during basketball practice uh, at the University of Southern California, if you remember. He was a perfectly healthy individual, very fit, dropped. Cardiac arrest is uh, not the same as a heart attack, but the event and several others like it raise questions more uh, broadly about cardiovascular health and young people. Now in Sri Lanka too, as uh, you've seen, perhaps experienced in your close circles, about 100 to 150 new cases of heart disease are reported daily in the nation and most of them are young people. That's alarming, 100 to 150. Now, in an article published on the island, the uh, doctors uh, who noted this issue attributed this factor to poor air quality in the country. Is that the case? Is poor air quality in Sri Lanka to blame for over 100 young adults being uh, rushed to the emergency room? Let's bring in Professor uh, David Richards from the University of Australia. He's also part of uh, the Australians for Science and Freedom Initiative, and he joins me via Zoom from Gold Coast. Thank you very much, uh, Professor, for taking the time. I really appreciate it. Now, Professor, we see across the world, young adults suddenly experiencing heart conditions. In Sri Lanka, too, uh, we see a sudden spike in those events. Now, our officials say that it's due to heat and poor air quality. 
Do you buy that explanation? That's a really important question you're asking, Mahisha. Um, uh, we, we were concerned about this at the ASF, you know, the Australians for Science and Freedom. And for that reason, we commissioned a the 45 country study where we looked at 45 countries around the world. We used our world in data, which is <clears throat> comes from the Mayo Clinic. That was used by Deborah Burks uh, from the White House. So it was good enough for the White House. It's good enough for the ASF. And uh, basically, we um, we looked at the causes of these excess deaths around the world. And what we found, the single most important contribution to excess deaths was was the fact that people were being pushed into poverty. Poverty account, the increase in poverty witnessed during the pandemic led to a 30% increase in all cause mortality around the world. Uh, there was a massive transfer of wealth from the poor to the rich during the pandemic. During this period, there was a huge degree of exploitation. People, commercial opportunities were taken to take advantage of the the the, the um, opportunities that were available to to ex extort people, extort people really, to be honest, extort governments and and uh, health health authorities around the world through fear. And as a result of that, um, there was a massive, massive transfer of wealth, and it was that. Um, that that sinking into poverty. So many people who had marginal existence were pushed into poverty, and as a result of that, it led to it pushed pushed people's lives back thirty years. The, the 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 gains that we'd made in the last thirty years in terms of health and well being were were pushed back, and um, and uh, it caused enormous amount of damage. Lockdowns themselves. We we also found that in the first twelve months of the pandemic, the lockdown measures themselves led to a 20% increase in mortality directly. And um, and also we found there was a 10 to 15% increase in mortality where people were struggling to access healthcare. And, um, and those were the major contributions. So <clears throat> certainly we can look at the traditional factors like the climate and, um, and cholesterol and blood pressure and so forth. But the big change, the big change over the last three years has been the the consequence of those response to the, those pandemic measures. Absolutely. Professor, this is an alarming trend. We were told uh, to eat well, exercise and have a healthy lifestyle and then you will win your life. Why do you think these mysterious incidents are occurring? What changed recently for young adults to experience these episodes uh, suddenly? Well, I think that there's very, it's very clear that across the world, the, particularly in the young, there was the increase in social isol isolation had a massive effect on their on the health generally, and in particular, what we saw was that um, uh, there was an increase in many areas. There was an increase in illicit drug use and social isolation. That that combination of illicit drug use and social isolation um, was 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 really toxic and had a a, a really uh, detrimental effect, really bad effect. A lot of people who would maybe have uh, taken drugs and maybe survived because they had someone close to them who could have looked after them, they ended up uh, in that situation of social isolation, uh, uh, dying as a consequence of those, uh, that drug use. And uh, what we saw across the globe as well is an increase in drug use. Uh, I actually looked at uh, the um, situation in Sri Lanka and um, 17% of teenagers um, are using drugs uh, during that, you know, as, as well. And so uh, that had a massive, um, uh, massive impact on the health of people. Now, now some people uh, would be concerned that it, it, it might be an effect of the vaccination and my, myocarditis. We, we didn't find that. We didn't find that it made a, a massive increase in the number of deaths, uh, not, in, not in our survey. I did a back of an envelope calculation on the number of deaths. I, I looked at, I thought about Sri Lanka. I looked at, I, I looked at the vaccination rates. I figured about thirty percent of young people had had vaccinations, and um, and I looked at the, you know, the rates of myocarditis in various published studies, and um, you know, there would have been some deaths from myocarditis as a result of the vaccination. Uh, my estimate is that that number would have been somewhere on, on the back of an envelope calculation, somewhere between two and four hundred deaths. Uh, that that would be the range. Uh, the four hundred deaths 
come in over a, a long period, you know, talking about 10 years. So it's like no, it's unlikely that, um, that, that, that the vaccine made a substantial contribution to the number of deaths that we are seeing in young people. Absolutely. Professor, your advice to anyone uh, watching, how can someone identify uh, these symptoms? Because young adults are rare to be, uh, visit cardiologists thinking that they could potentially have heart issues. Well, I think from from the fact that, you know, drug, drug taking had a big contribution, I think, you know, obviously um, being, being aware of your risks taking drugs is really important. Making sure that you're communicating with people around you if you know obviously the ideal thing is to stop taking drugs but but making sure you're in you're not socially isolated making sure that you have you're, you're communicating with people people are keeping an eye out for you it's community that saves lives the other thing i think that's really important for young people is to find a, a, a doctor that they can rely on and trust you know because if you've got someone who's got your back then you know no matter what you've got you can you you've got someone who's going to be watching out for you and, and that makes all the difference in the world i mean obviously diet is really important and you know sri lanka from what i understand there's a traditionally a vegetarian diet which is excellent and a really good way to prevent heart heart disease and because western food we know is is very bad for contributing to heart disease and exercise is really important you know um you know um go out play cricket play i i do triathlon you know, sport, you cannot underestimate the value of sport in our society. It's a fantastic way to keep healthy. Absolutely. Uh, Professor David Richards, let's uh, leave it at that. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Let's take a short break. On the other side, we will speak about the health of our economy. This is the State of the Nation. Back in a moment. everyone to the state of the nation let's talk about sri lanka's economy now to gauge the health of any economy we often turn to indicators such as the stock market gdp growth and unemployment rates but well, these can provide a snapshot of the overall economic performance they sometimes tell a partial story now the world bank predicts uh, sri lanka's gdp growth in uh, to, to rebound in the coming year showing signs of progress However, there are deep-rooted challenges that still needs our attention. The question is, are we going in the right direction or are we doing the same thing, hoping it will give us different results? Let's get some data on this subject. For that, joining me now uh, is Imran Furkan, economic, uh, economic analyst uh, who joins me from the data board. Imran, good to see you uh, here, man. Uh, thank you very much for taking the time to uh, join me uh, today. Now, what do you think about Sri Lanka's economic trend? Do you think that we are heading in the right direction? Well, um, as you said rightly, Mahesh, um, we, we are, it's a, uh, a story of two parts, right? So if you look at uh, inflation numbers, we're now at single digits, um, you know, um, a lot lower than the 60% we had somewhere last year. But that's the rate of inflation. That's the rate at which it's, it's growing. But what you don't see is that the, 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 the value of goods and services, the purchasing power of the individual has come down dramatically, right? So the, if you take the index of 2021 where, where the purchasing power is at 100, today, uh, even though inflation is at about a single digit, that particular index is at 190. Mm -hmm. So that's between January 2021 and now, the price of goods and services has almost doubled. Um, and, I'm, I'm, and if you ask anybody, they'll confirm to you that their salaries haven't doubled, right? Yes, exactly, yeah. exactly. So therefore, what we're having is that the purchasing power of the community has diminished by half. So the quality of life has, has gone down dramatically. And, and unless we tackle that issue, yeah. I don't think people are going to feel economic growth. Indeed. Uh, in addition to that, um, if you look at our 
uh, uh, trade, right? At least this is merchandise trade, uh, not necessarily services. You see that uh, over the, the period of uh, January to July, July is the last uh, month for which we have statistics and we'll have uh, you know, the August one very soon. Um, we can see that there is a reduction, um, particularly in our exports to our key markets, right? Um, and we have an overall reduction uh, you know, in terms of, of uh, the exports between uh, last year um, yeah. and the same period this year, about uh, almost, uh, you know, 11, 12% uh, 11, of that. And that's a bit of a worrying sign because A, last year was not a good base for this, right? Yes, we were yes. in trouble. So we're taking a lower base and then we are performing worse than that. And then I think that is a challenge that we need to address. Now, there are reasons for this. Obviously, the main reason is because of the fact that in our key export markets, the US, the EU, they're going through a very difficult economic times due to higher interest rate. But um, that also, sorry, yes. No, I, I, I was uh, just to say that apparently, uh, I think they actually reported around 1 billion uh, uh, sales of uh, exports uh, for July, in, the, month in, in, July. The, in the last month yes. uh, on this matter. Yes, yes. Um, I think uh, that's a, a very good sign, and I think we saw some of that even even last year. There were a few months where we made a, a, a billion, so that that is month on month, uh, uh, you know, change. But I think what we need to focus on is a lack of diversification of our exports and also our key markets to which we diversify, right? Um, and we haven't really tackled the need yeah. to to go to places like China, increase uh, you know uh, engagement with India. Um, and I think we need to work on that. I think we're working on some of the free trade agreements, but I think we need to work faster than this. Absolutely. Because if we have a low base than last year and we are performing worse than that low base, I'm really worried about how next year is going to be like. And we need these dollars in terms of exports. Absolutely. Now, uh, uh, institutions like uh, uh, Bloomberg is not exactly giving us good indicators saying about the future of Sri Lanka's economy because they're continuously predicting that they, things could get uh, worse from now onwards. And uh, even, uh, I'm, I'm, I mean, we've been talking about this fact that uh, the rupee might hit around 355. That's what they're predicting. But uh, let's see what happens. And hopefully that it won't go to that level because I think more than 350 was the time that uh, former President Gotabe Rajapaksa had to leave uh, his office uh, last year because it was really bad for the people. All right, uh, Imran Farukhan, economic, uh, economic analyst uh, at the Data Booth. Thank you very much for that. Thank you, Mahesh. Now, one indicator of this matter is how the rupee is behaving. And a couple of weeks back, I showed you what Bloomberg was saying about Sri Lanka's rupee. Despite the positive trend from the government, financial analysts overseas believe that we are not yet out of the woods, or at least not even in the midst of it. The only thing we need to focus on is self-sufficiency in our economy if we are to thrive, meaning uh, we need to find ways and means of building things here, first for ourselves and then more to sell to the world. Now that's uh, how all top economies around the world manage to be successful. Let's get a clarification uh, on this and for that, uh, let's bring in uh, former governor of the Central Bank, Ajit Nimad Cabral. Thank you very much, governor, for taking the time to join me. Uh, now, governor, the Central Bank has requested uh, to reduce lending rates, uh, but the bank seems uh, very reluctant to do this. Why is that? And is the decision by the Central Bank uh, correct on this uh, for further growth. Good evening, Mahesh. It's good to be back in your program. Uh, you see, it's ironical that the central bank is asking the banks to reduce the interest rates while they themselves are paying higher interest rates every week. Just yesterday or two, two or three days ago, the treasury bill rate went up, the cutoff point went up to over 19 percent. When the government and the central bank on behalf of the government is paying 19%. They are asking the banks to lend on pawning deposits or pawning advances at 18%. So, you see, you have to walk the talk. If you ask the banks to reduce, then you have to also ensure that the reduction is taking place within the government side. Now, if that is not taking place, these requests are just hollow requests. So, we got to understand that the central bank must set the benchmark, it must set the yardstick and then stick to that. Otherwise, don't say it because the credibility is lost. So, we got to understand that people don't only look at what the messages are from the central bank statements. They watch what the central bank does. 
So, if every week the central bank is increasing the interest rates, the banks will say, hey, what's, what's this uh, all about? They are asking us to reduce and how can we compete with other uh, gaining advances and gaining deposits if the central bank is paying 19 plus for deposits themselves. So, I think uh, we also got to see that there is a reflection of the ground situation on the talk that the central bank is making and at the same time you can say goodbye to growth at these interest rates. Interest rates were increased on the 8th of April 2022 and since then growth has been negative more than 10 percent every quarter. So, we got to have a revamping of these interest rates if you are going to ever see growth again and unless we do that we can say goodbye to growth. Absolutely. Uh, Governor, I, I don't know whether uh, you remember a report uh, from Bloomberg recently uh, that talked about the Sri Lankan rupee crashing and falling over 350 rates uh, by the end of this year. Any truth to that? Because uh, Bloomberg seems to be pretty confident about their predictions. I think Bloomberg is right. All the ingredients for the rupee to depreciate are presently in place. The mm. IMF has said you got to release all the import restrictions. All the currency restrictions that have been imposed have also got to be released. So, in that context, the moment we start paying our debts or even before that with the imports now most probably going to increase, Sri Lanka is going to see the rupee having a huge tumble. The IMF itself, it is ironical that they themselves in their report of March 2023 uh, sorry, March 2023, they have also said that the rupee could perhaps uh, go to as much as 462 per dollar. So, Bloomberg has said 350. I would think uh, IMF number and the Bloomberg number uh, should be considered when people look at it and that is going to happen. And also, we got to understand when you go into these IMF programs, the currency depreciation and the interest rates increase is inevitable. Today, Pakistan is reporting after their one and a half years of uh, the IMF uh, uh, program that their currency has hit the lowest. Argentina is reporting that the interest rates in Argentina are now 97 percent. So, these are the experiences of countries which have been in a, re in a program recently with the IMF and that is what is happening. So, unless we are very, very careful and watching out for these different types of signals to ensure that we do not fall into that same situation, we can very easily get into that trap and many, many countries have fallen into that. So, I think uh, we got to be very careful and unless we do that, you probably find that the rupees are out of control, the interest rates are out of control and Sri Lanka can be in very, very serious trouble. Governor, uh, soon the IMF uh, teams will be back in Sri Lanka. They will basically take stock of how we did uh, with the 350 odd billion uh, for the first tranche uh, they gave us um, to see whether we qualify for the next tranche. Uh, this time, what do you think uh, the conditions are going to be? And I don't know, our governor, the government seems to be pretty confident that our economy is on the right track and it's recovering. See, Mahesh, before you jump into the water, unknown waters, you have to see the condition of the water. How deep is it? Is there mud in it? Is, are there crocodiles inside? So, if you just jump in and then you start looking for a savior, then you are in trouble. We went into the IMF program without knowing exactly what we are going into. There were people like me who said, be watchful, be careful about what is going to happen, but nobody listened. Nobody cared to listen. Today, we are reaping those uh, benefits of what we have got into. Today, we have seen our growth is plummeting. We have seen joblessness going beyond our any type of uh, imagination. People are without work. People are finding it very difficult to make ends meet. Taxes have tripled. The commodity prices are three times. So, naturally, we are in a contractive mode. So, when, when the IMF comes, they will impose further conditions. But I would say that adhering to those conditions will cause more pain than we ever had. We are now looking at restructuring. We are talking about restructuring, but we have been talking about restructuring since April 2022. We are still nowhere near completion. 
restructuring that we started was said to be first for the foreign debt restructuring. Today, the local debt restructuring is being done and that too only with the superannuation funds EPF and ETF, not the others. Just see a few days ago, we paid 19 percent for the treasury bills of three months and we are saying that the EPF return will be capped at 9 percent. So, whom are we fooling? What is happening? So, actually this is a very, very serious condition which we got to take stock very quickly because IMF will impose conditions and IMF will not be so concerned about the outcome and the consequences. Already people are talking about IMF riots. All over the world it has happened. In more than 14, 15 countries we have seen some acute riots which have been propelled by the IMF conditions. So, Sri Lanka is going that path. Unless Sri Lanka takes stock and finds some alternative path to steer without these uh, disabilities being imposed upon people, I think we will have a huge problem on our hands and that is something the government will have to think before they get into it rather than after they get into it. Absolutely. Let's leave it at that. Former Governor of the Central Bank, Ajit Nivad Cabral. It's always a pleasure to speak to you, sir. Thank you. I don't know whether you uh, noticed uh, that despite the government, even Imran uh, was talking about it uh, um, earlier on, you know, despite the government, the central bank, its current governor, the finance minister, the president and the IMF uh, singing praises about the economy is on the right track. You and I are not feeling those songs, are we? Why is that? Still, everything is costly, everything is unbearable and the only thing that isn't increasing is your monthly wage. So why isn't the ground economic situations reflected in the so-called indicators used by uh, all big, shot, uh, big shots in our current administration? Joining me now is political economist Niyanthani Kadragamar. Uh, uh, she is uh, joining me uh, currently in Sri Lanka and she joins me. Uh, thank you very much uh, Niyanthani uh, for uh, taking the time to join me. Now on the ground we are hearing that uh, the people are facing hardships. The SME sector is taking a massive hit and uh, uh, businesses are closing, but in Colombo, the central bank and the rest of the places where they say that they are taking care of the economy, all indicators show that Sri Lanka is basically on the right path. What are we not seeing here? Why is the ground reality not being reflected in these uh, theoretical indicators that are determining uh, that are determining the health of our economy? Thank you for having me, Mahesh. Um, yes, I think it's true that although the government is implementing an economic recovery plan uh, since last year, uh, people's lives have actually gotten worse. Um, we can see when we talk to people um, the effects of the economic crisis as well as the economic recovery plan uh, has made their lives uh, worse than what it was before. Now the government on their part, they think that implementing the IMF program and making sure the, the milestones of the IMF program are met, they are going to be achieving economic recovery. Uh, however, it does not mean that uh, people's lives are going to improve. We know from experiences elsewhere um, that uh, the, the, the sole motivation for the IMF is to ensure that every rupee and every dollar from Sri Lankans are channeled back to international creditors. Um, whether that uh, means economic recovery for Sri Lanka or not is not has not been their concern. Um, furthermore, uh, I think there are uh, enough indicators to show um, that the economy is not doing that well. For example, if you look at uh, the nutrition level of children under the age of five, we've seen that malnutrition has increased. We are seeing pregnant mothers um, uh, giving birth to undernourished children. Uh, we are seeing school dropouts. Um, the health sector is, is in shambles right now. Uh, even the indicators that the government has been putting forward, for example, uh, the inflation rates, um, although we see the rates coming down, it has not really transferred in uh, food prices coming down for people and therefore uh, the cost of living burden has not reduced for the people. 
Furthermore, if I can give you another example, um, if you look at the fuel cost, and it's a common refrain that the fuel crisis has been um, solved, resolved in Sri Lanka. However, if you look at consumption levels, we have seen that uh, consumption levels have dropped almost by half. And these are not just indicators about individual consumption, it's an indicator of the overall economy and its health because reduced cons consumption of fuel or electricity means reduced economic activity uh, overall. Absolutely. Uh, well, uh, let's leave it at that. Uh, thank you very much, uh, political economist uh, Ni Anthony Kadrugamara, who is also a researcher on the economy, women's and labor and also a uh, part of the University of Massachusetts in Ham Amherst, USA. Thank you very much. More State of the Nation right after this break. Back in a moment. everyone to the state of the nation now one of the areas that Sri Lanka is failing is its foreign policy and more importantly understanding global threats that are coming into the country under the guise of supporting Sri Lanka the prime example is what happened last year with the so-called Aragalaya we are now learning that geopolitics played a key role in the Aragalaya to steer Sri Lanka from Chinese influence to the Americans and the collective West I mean Take a look at this picture. Need I say more? Now, despite whatever we say right now, our foreign policy, which was under the Rajapaksa regime's allegiance to the East, has successfully been changed to the West. Let's bring in Dr. John Harrison, the Associate Professor of Homeland Security at Rob Dunn University in the UAE. He joins me via Zoom from Abu Dhabi. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. for taking the time. Now, in the Indian Ocean, uh, Sri Lanka is sitting in the middle of India and uh, India, China and the United States. From time to time, the allegiance changes. Uh, right now, the economy dictates that we need all three. Now, Doctor, in your opinion, how should Sri Lanka shape its foreign policy? Do you think uh, these non-aligned stance would work uh, to the benefit of this country? Well, Mahesh, thank you for, for that. It's a very important question. Uh, First of all, I, I would just quibble with the term a little bit, non-aligned. That, that's an old Cold War term. Uh, but what I think is more appropriate now is for many nations are looking at to create as many partnerships uh, as they can. And they're not always going to overlap with uh, p every country's political or geostrategic interests all the time. But as any nation will, Sri Lanka will have to look at what is in its best interest. Uh, is it, there may be political reasons or geostrategic reasons, there may be economic reasons. And to, for a nation to have the maximum flexibility uh, that is allowed by A, being able to sort of uh, entice various, various actors to give uh, Sri Lanka the best deal it can, but also it gives it maximum flexibility. And it's, it will be able to potentially avoid some problems if uh, a conflict or tension breaks out amongst two or more of the, uh, of the parties. But it also positions them potentially to be uh, an open and uh, accepting nation where they might be able to use that and use the good offices of being able to be friendly and cooperating in a variety of fashions with all nations uh, to be able to maximize its potential, not only economically, but politically. Absolutely. Um, all right. We had to leave it at that. Uh, Dr. John Harrison uh, from Rob Dan University in the UAE. Thank you very much. Short break now. We'll be right back with the closing. Sri Lanka is a place where nature's beauty merges with cultural richness and has faced its share of economic challenges. 
But my friends, I believe that with a change in thinking, this incredible nation can rise to achieve unprecedented success. However, the economic crisis that we are in right now has made us rethink whether Sri Lanka is the country that I or you want to call home. It's evident in the number of passengers at the airport exiting the country every day. But here's the thing. Overcoming these challenges starts with a change in the mindset. Embracing innovations is critical to pave the way for Sri Lanka's economic transformation. By fostering a culture of creativity, they can tap into the vast potential of entrepreneurship, technology and digitization. Think global. Sri Lanka is uh, strategically positioned in the Indian Ocean and has advantageous trade relationships. This nation can emerge as a regional economic powerhouse by leveraging these global opportunities, embracing international partnerships and diversifying trade. My friends, the road to economic transformation is not easy, but Sri Lanka has all the ingredients needed to succeed. By changing our thinking, embracing innovation, investing in education, practicing sustainability, developing infrastructure and leveraging global opportunities, Sri Lanka can overcome its challenges and become an economic force to be reckoned with. To share your views, suggestions and thoughts, do get in touch with us as we would like to hear from you. You can write to us about anything you saw on the program. You agree, disagree, please send us your comments to stateofthenation at derana.lk. I'm Mahesh Johnny from all of us at Other Derana 24. Have a good night and a productive week. I'll see you on Tuesday on Getting.